So, Jim, I thought, you know, here we are at Deep Elm Live with a big DVD shoot us tonight. Yeah, Deep Elm Live. And I thought that maybe we would uh, take a little walk around the neighborhood. And right. uh, you could sort of tell people watching the DVD, uh, you know, where it all kind of started. Yeah. We sort, of, we sort of met each other down here a long time ago. Well, you know, way back in the 20s and 30s, Deep Elm was a real hot spot for nightclub activity for uh, the black community, you know, and, and all the big bands and, you know, Duke Ellington, Count Basie, you know, and even even before that, Robert Johnson and Blind Lemon Jefferson, they all played down, down in down this here. area. It was in the early 70s, I, I was asking my grandfather when we came to visit him, and I lived in Corpus Christi, and I said, uh, you know, I want to see Deep Ellum, I got to see, and he's going, you want to see Deep Ellum, you know wow. why? So he took me down to Elm Street. That's that was really where the Deep. This is the Deep Ellum district, but you know Deep Ellum was really Elm Street. And I remember going down there in the '70s, and it was a trip. By then, it was all burnout, old bars and mm -hmm. pawn shops and mm -hmm. and all that. Well, that that kind of eventually faded out, and it became an industrial type district where right. you have businesses like well, like Texas. Were, refrigeration and butcher supply I remember right. that very well that's been there for a yeah. long time yeah. but, but then uh, Russell Hobbs opened up a place down there we'll show you in a second it was called theater gallery yeah I remember that that's it used and, to live there right that was that was the first nightclub to come back in here except for maybe now Adairs has been there for a long time yeah the little it, it's like a country and western sort country of. and western burger and burger joint bar and grill type place yeah but the first kind of you know alternative nightlife bar was or club was theater gallery and it really wasn't like a club as let's much let's go down as, there and check it out yeah okay let's go check it out but yeah it was well it was kind of like a scene as well is that what oh, you're saying yeah, I mean, yeah was, because well for one thing it wasn't really I don't think Russell had his liquor license, so they didn't really do liquor a lot, but they would do private parties some, and I got divorced and didn't have a place to live, so I ended up moving in here, and uh, this is it. I mean, yeah, it, doesn't really, it. It, doesn't, it doesn't look, I mean, I would hardly even recognize it. Yeah, it's not the no. same now anymore, but uh, it used to be called Theater Gallery, and it was really the only place down here, and it was really the beginning of the whole melding of the art, art and music and theater scene all in one little place right here and there wasn't really much going on and uh, one of the interesting things about it too is that before and you might want to ask Russell and what I remember and I don't know if this is exactly true but the, pe the people from ASCAP and BMI were coming in saying oh you're playing music so you have to pay us money right, right. and so his answer to them was well all the bands that play here play original music and before that, that you know, in Dallas, it's like all cover bands. Right? right, you had to play all cover songs, or you didn't play. You didn't. Right. There was no place for original bands. There was a place called the Twilight Room, which was up the other side of the freeway down there, and we played there too. And that that was before Theater Gallery. So mm -hmm. he, you know, Russell was kind of getting set up with with this neighborhood, which there really wasn't anything over here. But uh, but you know, I mean, I kind of feel like I was like at least a part of because I was setting up the, the 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 PA Jeff Lyles would book the gigs and Russell Hobbs was you know he owned the place to coordinate the shows and uh, but you know I mean I kind of feel like if we hadn't have been there you know Dallas may still just be cover bands yeah and, probably you know, yeah and I lived up in this loft that they called the heat seeking missile because it got to be about 110 degrees up there and it was so uncomfortable and so hot that I'd, I'd have to like sleep with fans and they did have a shower in the back so what I'd do is I'd I'd go get in the shower cold water because it was so hot and I would walk so I, was, so I was still wet and I'd go walk and climb up into my bed and turn the fan on and I had some ice there I put on my head it's like a poor man's air conditioning system right <laughs> right and, and there was no ventilation and there were rats and ro rats and roaches this big it was really crazy but they, they used to laugh that they thought it was funny that I was living up there they called it the heat seeking missile yeah and that mixed with my my last name is Heath I think that's kind of where the heat kind of came in but I used to, I was working here and I, I had bands and I was trying to get him to give me a gig and he was always, 
Well, I don't think that's, I don't know if that's the kind of music we want, but then one day he heard me playing and singing, and then I did a gig with this band called the Beat Orgy, and he heard me, and he said, I'm going to, he goes, I'm going to give you a gig. He goes, but I'm opening up a new place, and I want you to be the first guy. And so he, uh, I was either the first or second act to play at this place, the Profit Bar, which is over there across the street. Yeah. Yeah, but I guess we should walk over there yeah, let's, and let's, let's go let's look at the that. profit bar. Now. Okay. So, yeah, and it was called the profit bar, and I think it's because he wanted to actually make a profit, but it was also he spelled it P R O P H E T, like prophecy. Yeah, no, profit yeah. Bar. So he opened this place up, and and he told me he said uh, be there Thursday night, and so I, you know, a week from Thursday or something like that. So I was you know grateful that I had a gig, and I showed up, and I'm, it was just doing a solo thing, and I. Uh, I was setting up my amp and, or, and getting my guitars out. What my guitar? I didn't have. I think I just had one. But anyway, getting it all out and before the gig, and he came and he said, "Horton, your stage name is going to be Reverend Horton Heat." <laughs> and I said, "That's stupid." You know, I mean, I, I didn't want to do. A, it was too sticky. You know, I didn't. You know, and for one thing, I didn't want to compare myself to Reverend Gary Davis because. That's 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 an he's unbelievable and one of my heroes and I didn't want to try to rip off somebody that was that great or something but I didn't even know what was going on and he had listed it in the papers and I figured there wasn't going to be anybody there well there was actually 50 or 75 people and after my first set they're coming up saying Reverend that was great and I'm going everybody started calling me Reverend and I was thinking what and then I'd noticed the flyers and then I looked and saw it was listed in the paper and there were people there that liked it and I mean I was so flattered that I'd, I'd had to run with it I was so poor living up there and just no money at all and I you know I it was he could have said hey your stage name is you know you know crap on the ground right, right. and I would have been up there hi Great. thanks a lot I'm crap on the <laughs> ground you know I mean I was desperate so I was grateful to have the gig, and uh, and it was it was really a cool thing because eventually, you know, he was paying me off the percentage of the door, and eventually I was starting to like get more and more people. So where there'd be a hundred people at the shows, and I, I would play every Thursday night. I remember. And so then eventually the, the I got this following thing going, and I started bringing in some pretty good money, and I was thinking, damn, I could hire some you know musicians to come play with me because it was all solo before which I, it's right cheap. right right and so uh i got in touch with uh, this guy jack barton who was in a, a some rockabilly type bands here in dallas i remember and jack slapping jack or smiling jack sw- he had a bunch of yeah. names yeah <laughs> right right and uh and so me and jack and then a drummer peter kaplan we started playing and we had an accordion guy tim alexander would come play accordion with us and uh now that's one thing I remember because I remember those Thursday nights and every Thursday night it seemed like more people came. And the other funny thing I remember is that everyone was there the first Thursday night, was there the next Thursday night, plus their friends. And they were like going crazy. And people were like swing dancing, slam dancing, any kind of dancing. It was fun, man. I mean it was like it was like the funnest night in town. And, yeah. And right here and you know, it was a trip. Oh, yeah, I was, it was a I, good time. Yeah, I was I was obviously really grateful uh, to Russell for setting me up with all that and uh, but, but another thing that was kind of cool is that I don't think Russell liked too much, but all of a sudden they started opening up new clubs, Club Dada and Club Clearview and, and things. And they would all, when they opened up, they'd all come to me and want me to play. And right. so all of a sudden I had three or four steady gigs just within this little four block area I could play. And so. Uh-